Hey, my name is uh, Vale, but you can also call me Joale if you like the H. I'm a white person, as you can see, <laughs> with a lot of privilege. And one of the privilege maybe brought me here, but I hope that are the one where we solidarize together. So I work for APC, the Association for Progressive Communication, and coordinate a project that is a network of people, and it's an exploration. It's called erotics. And erotics come from uh, Spanish. It was an exploratory research on sexuality. Why sexuality? Because humans, believe or not, are very often sexual beings. But this doesn't come with uh, positive uh, add-ons. So what we are going to talk together with my friend, Smita, from Point of View, Sancha from the Web and Media Collective, and uh, Jotsna from Loom, which are from respectively Nepal, Sri Lanka, and India. We are going to share with you what we have learned in two years. We have done uh, two things that we are trying to discuss together with you. And I really welcome questions, comments, suggestions, and sharing of experience. We have done uh, researches, researches in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka and in Nepal, I would say baseline research on sexuality and the internet, meaning how gender equality advocates, women's rights, sexual rights advocates, LGBTIQ people use the internet. How they use and what is their perception. What is the, the legal framework? So what are the rules? The rules set by the, the state, the rules set by, set by a regulative body, the social norms, and how they respond to the opportunity and the threats that internet uh, give. And those are the two research and we will hear more. And then the research in India, because uh, India is already part of this network that existed since 2008, and I've done their baseline. It's uh, focusing on a thing that probably we had already heard these days. It's about obscenity. And we will talk about this. And then there is another little piece. It's a survey. We did uh, uh, a survey that wanted to understand how surveillance, censorship in relation with sexuality, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's happening. And what the people, again, sexual rights activists in a very wide spectrum, how they use. So I will start giving you some of the things that uh, came out from the survey, because they are also connected with the findings from the research. Uh, so the people think that the internet uh, is uh, a place they need. It's the space where their voices get heard. But they are not, you know, the, the happy, happy relationship when we were thinking the internet is the space where everything comes through and your uh, better, best dream comes through. This happy, happy life is ending. People are aware that internet is not a safe space. People are aware that internet is a private space, that it's held by private corporation, big corporation. And they do not care very much about people, about their safety, about their freedom, about their diversity, even if they always say that they do. So this is the first, the baseline. It's an awareness. But 75%, uh, we had a, a small sample. That's why it's exploratory. It's uh, 362 respondents. The 75% of them had experienced harassment. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, uh, people feel the governments and ISP provider censor, but I also feel the peers censors a lot. And this is very common uh, in Africa, in Asia, in, uh, in, uh, in the, the, the so-called global south. There is one point when the north and the south disagree. So for the rhetoric of the north, and I'm saying North Europe, uh, North America, terrorism, it's the excuse used very often to censor and monitor the, uh, the internet. But for the global south, usually it's about obscenity, it's about modesty, it's about dignity. That's why we want to discuss about freedom of expression as sexual expression. And when I say sexual expression, it's really anything. It can be a text or can be an image. And there is no need to think about the sensitive images, you know, that on Twitter or any 
of the social network, they ask you if you, want, if you are sure that you want to look at this sensitive, sensible uh, imaginary. But it's just anything that can be considered sexual, because sexual is also in the eye of the viewer. So this is our, uh, what we have learned. And now I think it's, uh, we will do one round of questions, two rounds of questions, so that you can get a sense of the different situation and challenges in the countries. And then we can have a conversation. Question, comment, and suggestion, but also experience from your own country. So my first uh, uh, question goes to, to Smita. More than a question, it's, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, tell about how obscenity is framing in India and why obscenity. Thank you, Ali. Um, hi. So um, our research basically looked at one provision of the Information Technology Act in India called Section 67. It's uh, popularly known as the obscenity law because it criminalizes... Oh, okay, hi. Yes. Um, so it crim the Section 67 of the Information Technology Law in India criminalizes any transmission or publication of material which is lascivious or prurient and meant to corrupt people who see it. Now, it's a very, very broad provision, and it basically means that anything which can be perceived as obscene comes under this provision, and this is under the Information Technology Act overall. Um, in our research, we used mixed method methodologies to look at this one particular law. Uh, we used uh, quantitative data from the National Crime Records Bureau, uh, which puts out uh, data on the crimes, in, crimes and, the uh, and the sections used for different crimes in India every year. Uh, we also used uh, media reports of cases which have been filed under 60, Section 67, and uh, we use some interviews as well. Um, I want to speak to you about the findings which we got from the media reports. So what we did was we took cases from uh, 2015, 16, and 17 of all the uh, cases which have been filed under Section 67. We used uh, Google News and we used the exact parameters so that we get exact results for like each of the year's searches. Um, we came up with five main findings. One, that obscenity law, section 67, is used in cases where violation of consent is the main crime, right? Uh, there's a huge issue of rape videos being circulated in India. These are videos of actual rape, which are filmed and then used for blackmailing the survivors later into further rape or like for monetary benefits. Uh, here is again, it's a violation of consent. Another uh, prominent use of um, the section is in cases where um, it's used for silencing political and artistic exp expression. I want to show you a few images. Um, okay, so this is one of the latest cases which has been filed in India. Um, All India Bakchod is a, is a comedy group in India. It's a very well-known group. Uh, that is an image of our Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi with the dog filters from Snapchat. Uh, they were filed, uh, they were like, the, the, a case was filed against them under Section 67. Um, but it doesn't make sense because Section 67 is meant for, meant for obscenity, right? Um, here, what is obscene? Is it the dog filter? Is it the face? What is, why? Sorry? Yeah. I'm not saying it. <laughs> but um, that's, it, it, and this is not the only time this has happened. This particular group has come under, um, has been filed under this section like three times in the past one or two years itself. Um, it's also used to silence political speech. Um, this is an image of uh, one of the chief ministers of one of the biggest states in India, uh, him and his family on a yacht. He was vacationing and his personal handle had put, up the, put out this image. Someone used this image to say that, you know, there's a drought going on, on in the state and you're holidaying on a yacht. Um, that man, the, the Twitter handle, he was again filed under Section 67. In the recent years, with an increasing right, increasingly right-wing government in India, more and more cases are coming where political expression of any kind or political criticism is being filed under Section 67. Um, uh, could you go to the next image, please? Um, another prominent use of Section 67 has been in cases where uh, images have been mocked. In some cases, it's serious, like where a, a woman or a child's face has been mopped onto nude images, and those are circulated with obscene comments, often in regional languages. So uh, on social media, Facebook and Twitter is not able to identify it immediately. In some cases, it is a critique of, politi of politics. 
This is the image of, a, of the leader of a very prominent um, Hindu right-wing uh, extremist group in India called the RSS. And they, they, their customary uniform is basically a white shirt and khaki shorts. So someone like morphed the legs of a, uh, of a khaki pants wearing woman onto his upper body and he's doing the traditional salute. Uh, the person who put up this image on WhatsApp was again filed under section 67. Here you're, no, 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 the previous one, uh, next, just this, yeah, um, yeah, the long legs. <laughs> um, here again you have to wonder, like what is obscene here? Is it the fact that his, uh, is it the fact that he has woman's legs? Is that what is obscene? Is it the fact the, of the way it's standing? Here, if anything is a, is a crime, it's the violation of consent of using his image here. Um, as much as I may disagree with his ideology, it is his um, image of his self which has been used here. And that is what is the actual crime here, right? Um, another popular way the section has been used, actually, in a relatively better sense would be because um, would be to address online harassment. There is no exact provision per se to address online harassment in India uh, under the Information Technology Act. So section 67 is often used here. Uh, with certain recommendation, this can be amended, but right now that is one of the more prominent ways it's being used. Um, this is basically to give an overview of how this section is actually not needed right now because it's extremely vague, it's misused widely, and it's become kind of like a garbage dump for anything and everything. And it's basically being used to silence anyone who does not agree with the government, the chief minister, the prime minister, or any religious leader. Correction, any Hindu religious leader at this point. Um, yeah. OK, so for us, it was interesting because, as I say, through the survey, but also the other research, the issue of uh, uh, taking off the web anything that is uh, against the public morality, the dignity, uh, and what is obscene. So it's interesting how this issue, like a public issue, so in a gang rape video, what is obscene? Is the rape or the fact that a sexual act that was forced on a person is, what is the main scream? Where we would like to scream? Where is the injustice lie? Uh, and now we move to the other research to continue to this conversation. And let's see from Sri Lanka, what is the main, uh, the main thing that you bring with you? Uh, thanks, Vale. Um, so just to, before I tell you what the main findings were from our research to give you a background, um, we basically looked at um, how the human rights of LGBTQ Sri Lankans um, are, are used or utilized in the online space as well as how lesbian women uh, use the online space. So um, in Sri Lanka, non-heterosexual and non cis gender people who are known as LGBTQ Sri Lankans um, continue to live somewhat of um, invisible lives, you could say. Um, since the 1990s, they've tried to reform uh, the laws which criminalize homosexuality, but um, there has been no luck uh, to date. Um, so because of this, uh, many people don't come out. Um, they live secret lives, um, they don't come into government contact, and they're out of community organization, reach of community organizations as well as even amongst themselves. Okay. Um, so um, some of the key findings were that LGBTQ Sri Lankans use the internet for expression, for information, to mobilize, to build relationships, etc. And um, one, of, um, one of the things that we found was that there was an interesting uh, thing which they, talk, that, which they spoke about is was that before the internet, um, they had no information basically. They thought being homosexual was something unique um, unless they went to a library of course. And then once the internet came in, uh, basically uh, what they're saying is that there is more information now. There are more in, there's more information on homosexuality and what it's all about, basically. Um, also, um, they, they seem to um, share, share information. And this is information on, on sexuality in itself, maybe LBT uh, news, et cetera, something that is not really spoken about in mainstream media. Uh, so the internet has enabled that, and it, does, it has also enabled uh, a discourse on sexuality where they're able to discuss and, and talk about things even in closed groups, in, in uh, chat groups, that's et cetera. 
Um, also, um, when it comes to expressions, some of them <clears throat> talk about having real profiles with their real names, actual profiles, and them not being afraid to express themselves through these profiles, while others have fake profiles or anonymous profiles because there is continuous stigma and discrimination even in, in the online space. And so they use these anonymous profiles to share their information so that you know their family members may not know of them or even their colleagues at work. Um, because there are instances where uh, photographs from their private profiles have been used and put it on public forums where you know people have questioned it and used it in a political manner, questioning the prime minister, let's say, um, and, and putting them into shame where it has led to actually um, having this person either go off Facebook or um, remove all their friends and family members because they were afraid that it would affect their family members online. There was also a transgender person that mentioned how uh, her photographs were used um, and she was threatened. She was threatened saying that this would be used for pornographic intent. And she, of course, had said, go ahead, you just can do that. But these are just some of the instances where you know people have uh, used um, and taken for advantage. And uh, they've been taken for advantage, basically. Um, so e some, some people say that, some of the respondents in the study say that um, maybe you know people should be anonymous online, but then some of them also say that it doesn't serve the purpose that they should actually be online and they should be open about who they really are. So it's interesting how forking your identity, you know, there is your fake profile is your true profile. It's what you truly believes you are or one part of you that is important. But then because of the, the society, you normalize yourself with a true profile, which is a fake one, because corresponded to the attached string of your real name, but it's just what a society or a, legi or a legal framework expect you to be and to act and to perform. So for us, it was interesting to reflect uh, which one is the real fake one. Now let's move to Nepal and the, your issue, the issue that you find it the most interesting. Um, hi. Um, so given the Nepal's context, when we used to go for workshops and trainings earlier, we, you were, we were told that in Nepal there are three kinds of freedom of expression. One is political expression, uh, the second is creative expression, and the third is combination of both. But no one talked about sexual expression. Um, when, we, when we thought about doing this research on sexuality and the internet, we come from a very heteronormative culture where heterosexuality and male privilege is very much acknowledged and uh, very much allowed. So where do we find that space to talk about sexuality? Because in Nepal, sexuality is um, synonymous to sex and sex is a taboo. So sexuality also become a taboo. So where is that space for us to talk about sexual expression? Um, so we thought, you know, a lot of people went online to explore information and that was basically the space where we thought, let's do a research. There were two major backgrounds on why we wanted to do on sexual expression, but as political expression in the context of Nepal. Number A, the whole citizenship issue where earlier when we had, I mean, all of us, you know that Nepal went through a Maoist insurgency or the People's War, as I would like to call it, for at least 13 years. So in 2010, when we had our interim constitution, the interim constitution granted mothers to confer citizenship in her name. But when the 2015 constitution came, it actually said it had to have the name of the father and the mother if a child is to obtain a citizenship. And it became a lot of problems for mothers um, who were single mothers, who, who were separated, you know, who husband had disappeared, etc., were not able to confer citizenship in her name to her child. And that's when the whole issue of sexuality became a political expression for us. And uh, a large numbers of online campaigns and, you know, online petitions on sexual expression, citizenship, and sexuality became a political expression for us. Second thing was basically rape sexual violence that happened during the time of the conflict. 
and no one talked about it. Because whatever happened in the conflict, especially on what happened to women, was just a hush-hush matter. And even the government wanted to plead amnesty for all the perpetrators who committed sexual violence on women. So given that context, these were two premises why we thought we should have that research on internet and sexuality. So our research was basically to understand, you know, how women's rights activists, young women activists, and LBT activists actually access the internet. Uh, why do they access the internet? How do they do it? What is their perception of the uh, internet? You know, and especially in terms of expressing your sexuality online or sexual expression. There was a research done in 2016 by this Nepali NGO called Freedom Forum where they specifically say that in Nepal, obscenity is a major excuse to um, criminalize freedom of expression, whether it is general or whether it is online. So given that uh, premise, we spoke to a lot of um, women's rights organizations. So they were categorized in three groups. One were established professionals. So well-known women's rights activists who's been in that business for almost 25 years. And then young explorers, young women rights activists, you know, who are in online activism, who are raising similar issues, but the way they raise issue might be different, but it's still very political. And third was basically with the LBT communities. So one of the key findings that we found with established professionals were um, not being comfortable with the term sexual expression or sexuality. And also, um, they use internet to do activism or advocacy. And I still remember talking to one of the leading women's rights activists in Nepal, whom I said, you know, we're doing this research on internet and sexuality. And she said, oh, but I don't write about sex online. But then she works on abortion rights isn't abortion rights, talking about sexuality, isn't writing about abortion rights on the internet, sexual freedom or online expression. Um, the other thing also, we, f uh, we felt that the whole realm of sexuality is very much focused on reproductive health of married women. So when it comes to sex, when it comes to sexuality, again, it's only a space for married women who have access to information just because they have a uterus. So a lot of young women um, who wanted to have information on sexuality who, and who were not able to uh, get that information um, in books or in libraries or if they didn't have support system, they actually went online to look for information and they created their own groups to talk about it. But within the young explorers as well, uh, we had two groups. One was basically born in the 80s and 90s who live in Kathmandu, who are very much privileged, who have access to money. They were able to use the internet because they can afford to buy mobile data. But then outside Kathmandu, there were a lot of young women who also used the internet, but they didn't have, um, they had access, but they could not afford the internet. And they usually use the internet to talk about advocacy, but to talk about a lot of issues which they would not really discuss. Now with the LBT community, um, or L LGBTI community, um, within the LGBTI community, because we had, we, because our research was only limited to Kathmandu, it was basically um, gay people who had the privilege and the power to access internet in comparison to um, trans people. And even uh, a lot of um, groups who are lesbians did talk about it, but there was always an issue of, they use the internet for advocacy and activism, but a lot of them use the internet for um, dating app. Now, if you talk about obscenity within the context of Nepal, obscenity is very much um, related to women's body. So it's called ashtilta in Nepali, and it's always a woman who's ashtil. So again, when, uh, so again, what exactly does obscenity mean? It's very much related to a woman's body. Um, if, if you watch this Bollywood film called Queen, there was a particular, scene where the actresses takes off a bra and throws it on the basin and when we watched the film in Kathmandu, it was blurred. It was blurred in the name of obscenity. So it's right, so right now we're trying to understand what exactly is obscenity and what exactly is morality. Okay. 
So I don't know if you have, uh, if you want to add, if you have question, if you want to share your own uh, experience, uh, why you, you get upworm. I don't see hands. Uh, if not, we can continue. It shouldn't, it's not compulsory to yeah. see a hand. Uh, the question is to Stanchia. Uh, uh, talking, it's interesting because obscenity laws uh, don't always apply in the same way it does in the region uh, in Sri Lanka. And we have um, censorship uh, of film uh, and, and plays and theater and things like that. But in the recent times, we've had a spate of sort of few a full frontal nudity being uh, sort of not a problem in cinemas with an adults only tag. In 1982, we had a, 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 a full-on film with a, a, a central gay character. What would you say is, is the sort of the difference or the shift that is happening in Sri Lanka vis-a-vis, -vis, say, uh, or, or compared to India or Nepal? Do you see the, it as a trend or is it just random? Random that there is the, the, a the, film. The sort of, no, the laws that apply in terms of obscenity and things like that, don't always yes. apply the same way in Sri Lanka. Mm, Even yes. though we have censorship, it's yes. never got as far as the courts. Um, I was just yes, wondering I, I believe when we were in discussion, we all, at least India and Sri Lanka, has ha, do have the same laws uh, where it, it comes to criminalizing homosexuality as well as um, cheat by impersonation, which is used against transgender persons. And that law is used way more, way of, way more, way more often uh, than uh, the criminalized uh, law against LGBTQ persons. So, so from what we uh, gather is that um, transgender persons are targeted through these laws, um, and they they are being they are being harmed. They they are being their rights are being violated whereas LGBTQ persons are, are not so much uh, targeted and the laws are not used against them. But that being said, um, it does give um, authorities uh, some form of, um, um, some form of um, freedom to, to use these laws against them. And um, then you do see them being harassed and harmed um, in, in, terms of, in terms of that. Um, the shift you would say is perhaps during the war, um, everyone was under surveillance and this affected LGBTQ Sri Lankans even more um, than it did anyone else, especially women, especially LBT women. And so since the war, um, things have seemingly changed. There is some kind of new hope that people are expecting, which is how the new government was ushered in. And this has allowed uh, LGBTQ Sri Lankans uh, to, to express themselves more, to, to be out there in the open talking about their lives and, and their rights. And, and this is something that, has, that we see unfolding basically in, in Sri Lanka. So hopefully this will continue. Hi, uh, my name is Nighat, I'm from Pakistan. And since we are discussing South Asian uh, perspective on obscenity laws. We also have, you know, these laws in Pakistan, thanks to colonialism. Um, so um, uh, one aspect that I want to talk about is, uh, you know, the role of social media companies. Uh, so for instance, like we have a lot of censorship in the name of obscenity and immorality. So starting from Pakistani constitution, they derive, you know, uh, this or th these exceptions uh, on free speech to our cybercrime law and other legislations, and also Pakistani penal code as well. Um, and one thing that I have seen is that not only the country law enforcement or the authority or the regulator censor the content in the name of obscenity and immorality, but also they send requests to these social media companies because social media companies are obliged to respect local laws. So for instance, uh, at one point in time when there was a notification by Pakistan Telecommunication Authority to censor obscene words. They actually banned a Wikipedia page of breast cancer. Um, and then we saw, like we, we have been seeing, you know, like a censorship of 
these, um, you know, uh, different pages, uh, which they, which the authority think that comes under the obscenity and uh, immorality. But also now we have seen a lot of, you know, like interventions by social media companies as well in the name of respecting local laws. Yeah. So ju just a comment on that. You want to comment about uh, the, the obscenity and how how from uh, from colonialism to 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 now there is a conjunction. Um, as a part of the research, we also looked at literature around how obscenity was constructed. Um, it actually started to oppress, like to silence people who were speaking up against uh, religion at one point. Uh, one of the first. Uh, pieces of literature to be to be silenced under, to be um, booked under the obscenity law was something called Venus in the Cloister, which is about two nuns who have sex with each other and like with other uh, male members of the church. Um, the obscenity law was actually used against that piece of literature first. Then it was used to silence Protestant um, uh, pamphlets and books which came out about uh, against the Catholic church. That's how, that's how the obscenity laws came about in the in the Victorian England context. When it filtered down to the colonies, um, what happened was they went, the, uh, they, they claimed uh, cleanliness and hygiene here. So what they did was they um, uh, criminalized uh, women who were sex workers, saying that we are using doing this to protect the hygiene of uh, English soldiers. And they, that's how the red light areas and um, the, the, these laws came about. I think it was called the Venereal Diseases Act, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it all came in the, uh, in the, in the, with the excuse of promoting a, sanit, san, a, a, a civilized structure of you know, society, saying that certain kinds of literature is not meant for a civilized society. Uh, a society which is advanced will not read certain kind of literature like the Penny Dreadful novels which came about or Kama Sutra sex manuals which were being circulated um, earlier. And every time uh, the law became more in, intense, uh, or the, the usage of the law and obscenity laws became more intensified was when there was a change in technology. Before the internet, it was a printing press, right? Like, and, and before, uh, in between this came photography. Every time there's a technology which makes um, uh, certain kind of, you know, impure literature, impure content accessible to the common person, immediately the laws come about to say that, you know what, this is not how a good society is supposed to be. Yes, uh, my name is Jad. I am from Maldives and I am a journalist. Here you're talking about the social media and the laws and everything. But where, how, how what is it like in a country where re a recent happening in the Maldives, a child, a girl has been complaining to the government that the, we have constitution, a perfect constitution laws and but we do not have cyber crime laws there in Maldives but although this child has been complaining that her father has been harassing four ch girl children and the government did nothing she she was in an island Maldives is a, a nation with scattered islands all across the country and then she came to the ministry uh, th th that is uh, looking after the, the, these issues and complained about it nothing but then social media became a blessing to the girl. And the media took it. From that point only, the government took initiative to that. So what is it like in a country like that where laws are there, the Human Rights Commission doesn't work, and the administration is sleepy? So what is it like in a country like that? Uh, what laws are needed? What, what kind of media is required then? We say it's a one million, more than one million, one billion question. I don't know if some of you want to, want to answer. Uh, hmm? Okay. So what, uh, what we can say, what, what we learn, not only from this research but in general, is that all the, uh, all the frame, all the kind of views around the obscenity or dignity or morality are very vague and are very much related to a specific uh, vision of a society and are very, very much attached to a vision where uh, uh, sexuality 
especially female sexuality, is considered a taboo. And all this law very often do not act to defend the person which is harmed, but they act for a public interest. And, uh, and at the end of the day, so the gang uh, rape is not going to look into the consent, but is saying it's a disturbing image. So it's the framework. Having a law that is going in this direction, uh, the point is who will control the ones that make the law? So there are, there are several conversations that has need to happen together. Sexuality should not be a taboo. So sexuality is also health, reproductive health. People go online to learn, to search. But civil, what we notice also is that peer surveil and censor peers. Means there is an horizontal uh, surveillance and censorship that is done by people. And in the previous panel, we talked about populism and democracy. So democracy is the rule of the majority, is the rule that decide that this is the standard. Whoever is below or up doesn't fit. Democracy should allow diversity and minority to be there. But what we see, it's a rule of uh, the kind of rule that we have now. It's a rule that want to rule for all. It's one fit to all. So I, don't, I think it's very difficult to have an uh, answer. Because on the other side, and this is what also was Nigad was saying, social media interprets sexuality in a way that is very restrictive. Uh, blocking a, a page that talks about breast cancer, it's really, it's the last mile. So I think that we need to have a uh, different conversation. The law in itself cannot be the solution if there is not a reflection on the social norm. I just wanted to add a little something as well. Um, I also think it's extremely dangerous to ask for more laws, especially in countries where a certain majority is the ones forming these laws, and they do not take the account, the, the experience, live experiences of others into account. So asking for more laws is a slightly tricky terrain. Um, in, 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 in a case where there are no cyber laws, it's a different thing, because you have to build everything from the very beginning. In um, countries like India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, which have cyber crime laws, asking for more laws is a dangerous line which we'll have to think before asking. And um, another thing is like, like what Valle was saying, a, a law is there for a reason, but when um, times change, when, they, when you know that now, now that law is obsolete, you need to remove the law. Otherwise, your society is not going to move forward. It'll be like a vicious cycle, right? Like if in, in India um, and all, all three countries, uh, no, in Sri Lanka and India, we have homosexuality, which is criminalized. Um, if that law does not move with the times where they say that homosexuality is not a disease or it's not a criminal act, if it doesn't change, it's going to propagate the same stigma again and again in the societies. So law, it, it, it's, it's a cycle which has to move along with the times, otherwise it's going to get stuck like what's happening there without, with without cybercrime laws. It seems we have five minutes, so let's sure. have uh, a round, an answer, and, uh, and the last thing that you think is important to share. Okay, um, also in terms of women, and especially LBT women, definitely alternative media has been useful for expression. And uh, that being said, um, LBT women in the study did mention how they feel that they're being surveilled, either by their family or publicly. So even if, if it comes to their family, uh, they do feel that every post they make, every comment they made is being watched closely. And so it's, they, they feel like it's a form of discipline for them that, uh, that they should be you know, inclined into a, into a certain box or they should adhere to a certain norm. And, and if not, someone would mention it to someone in the family and put them into trouble. So um, some of the women said that they're not bothered about family surveillance because their families already know who they are, but they are um, concerned about public surveillance. So they are too, they're a little um, apprehensive about sharing something online, maybe because um, their colleague is on their Facebook profile, so they would think twice before they do uh, publish something. But um, in, in terms of expression and information, they do find it very useful 
So that is something to uh, consider. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of our research, um, when we spoke to the established professionals or um, a lot of women's rights activists who are above the age of 35, when we ask them, like, you know, you hear about all these um, young women who are subjected to violence because they are expressing themselves, expressing their sexuality, how do we think we should deal with the situation? So the whole situation was maybe we should regulate social media, maybe we should regulate online expression. So, um, so, so, so it just brought us to this dilemma is, what exactly are we talking about? So in the end, we said, you know, I think the information that we have with us is not adequate enough to justify where Nepal stands. Um, when, when we had the first people's movement in Nepal in 1990, that's when we saw the mushrooming of NGOs and violence against women was a big paradigm where people used this as a framework to work. So we said we should do a sub supplementary research. Let's do a research on online violence, but it is actually a manifestation of offline violence. There's no such thing as online violence that exists. But again, it comes with threads of the same thing, the whole, the whole realm of patriarchy that exists offline, and it's again, it's reflected online. So we did a small study which we named as, you know, because we did not want to call it online violence because when we start talking about online violence, it already uh, creates this, um, this judgments to our head that, oh, so which means that every time you go online, you will be facing online violence. So we thought, you know, why not talk about it as a manifestations of offline violence? So the same thing we did, we had focus group discussions with established professionals and women's rights activists, young women's rights activists, and uh, basically the um, LBT activist. So with the, with the whole group, so the more, more discussions was, do they face um, violence or, you know, they do, have, they, they express themselves, but do they face any kind of harassments and et cetera? And a lot of them said, not me, but my friend because um, I don't really express myself that much. So it was more into a, a self-censorship mode as well. Um, but when we um, spoke with a lot of women's rights organizations and activists, they said the same thing. I've never faced it, but my friends have. So in terms of law, like what Smita said, Nepal has the Electronic Transaction Act, but that Transaction Action Act per se does not really look into cybercrime. It's basically for financial transactions, financial payments, and basically ATMs. But Nepal is in the process of drafting the Online Freedom Act at the moment under the Ministry of Home Affairs. So we don't, so I mean, I don't have access to that power, so I, I can't really share with you if, if that act is going to come up with something. And uh, so there were so so there were a lot of uh, with the LBT activists as well. Um, they have faced um, violence online, and then we have certain categories of it, which is basically we have used the APC format. So um, these are some of the discussions um, they've had. So we have a supplementary report which has a lot of recommendations to the government of Nepal, to women's rights activists, to the internet service providers, and etc. Seems the time, uh, it's over. <laughs> anyway, I would like just to, to thank you for being here and to continue to think about freedom of uh, speech. That there is not only about words, words has a gender. It's not the case that the majority of uh, activity are the kind of uh, harassment that you see as a gendered component. So let's try to think how to go out from the binary so that we can have uh, sexuality on the internet as a resource, but also have a, a real spectrum of the freedom of expression, because we deserve it. Thank you.
Thank you to the moderator and the speakers of that session for an interesting discussion. Um, we are going to continue on the schedule. It's the 3.15 to 4.15 session, so you will find that some sessions have shifted a little bit. The roundtable 10 session is still ongoing, uh, the previous session, so you may have to wait if you're interested in that. But I'm just going to take you through the next few concurrent sessions. In, in this space, we have why is the web so unequal? There's a roundtable titled The Rise of Online Religious Nationalism in South Asia. There are two workshop sessions happening in the two tents just outside on your right. One is Threatened Voices Research and Data Visualization Workshop, and the other is Getting Started, Editing Wikipedia in Your Language. So those two workshops are in zone one and two, just to the right from here. The round table is in the building right opposite, opposite yeah. Just by the cafeteria. Okay, so we'll kick off the next session. Yes. Yeah. I'd like to invite the moderator, Solana, with the panel for the next session. Uh, ah. Behind now. Oh. Oh. Well done, guys. <laughs> Hello. This session is called Why is the Web So Unequal? And in the original title, it also said Why is the Open Web So Unequal? Um, which is an impossibly big topic to cover. We have so many different kinds of openness in mind when we talk about the open internet. And we also have so many different layers and levels of inequality that we could address as part of this conversation. On top of that, when we talk about the open internet, a lot of times we're talking about conversations or conflicts that take place in closed proprietary platforms um, like Facebook. So in the course of this conversation, we want to speak about both access and participation. Um, we're going to keep it conversational. You'll have a chance to, to speak as well. Um, we want as much as possible to focus on discussing the things that can help make the web live up to our ideals of equality, both online and offline. My name is Solana. Um, I now work with the Mozilla Foundation. I'm the editor of something that's called the Internet Health Report, which is not about doctors or nurses, but about um, whether the internet itself is healthy. Um, formerly, I was um, managing editor and once co-managing editor of Global Voices. Um, so it's nice to be back. Hey. Um, and I'll pass the mic to my co-panelists who will introduce themselves. So I'm Nathan Matias. I'm a postdoc at Princeton University in the Department of Psychology in the Center for IT Policy. And I lead a project called Civil Servant, which organizes internet users for a fairer, safer, more understanding internet. Hello, my name is Njeri Wangare. I am a poet, um, a writer, uh, and a digital strategist. I have, um, I'm passionate about arts and culture and uh, women, which I write on um, on my two blogs. I'm also a writer with, um, with Global Voices. And um, yes, I'm happy to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Anya Kovac. Uh, I'm a long-standing admirer from not that far, but still of Global Voices. So uh, it's my first time I'm at a summit, and it's a real honor and pleasure to be here. 
Uh, I work with the Internet Democracy Project in India. We work for an internet that supports free speech, democracy, and social justice through research, advocacy, and debate. Uh, we work sometimes from a gender perspective and always from a feminist perspective. Um, since, since Nate is a minority on this panel, I thought I would ask him the first question. Um, this, uh, why is the web so unequal is kind of a loaded, uh, a loaded question. Is, is the web unequal in your view? And you know, with all this criticism of you know, how utopian we were about the internet in the early days, have we become too dystopian about how it is now? It's a great question. I feel like often when we ask a question, is the web unequal, or we ask any normative question about the internet, we often bring to it our hopes about what we really want the internet to be and our deepest fears about what we think it might actually be. Uh, I think that's where drawing comparisons and grounding our understanding in uh, actual evidence can be incredibly helpful. So for example, if we look at women's participation online, uh, the Global Media Monitoring Report, for example, found that um, you know, a, a small but still substantial uh, gains have been made online in terms of the percentage of news that is written by women. Uh, we, we, when we compare online news to print, broadcast, radio, we find that a greater percentage of digital news around the world is produced by women than has traditionally been produced by um, mainstream media. When we look at things like Wikipedia, certainly there is a massive gender imbalance on Wikipedia. At the same time, when we compare it to the share of published knowledge about women and by women before the internet, um, we have a much greater wealth. So when we look at these questions, um, sometimes the empirical picture uh, puts cold water on our greatest hopes for the internet and reveals to us how much further we have to go. But at the same time, it can also help calm our deepest fears. Uh, and and our, you know, when we look at the gains that people have made uh, to broaden representation and voice online, those are very real gains that we need to avoid uh, discounting when we ask the hard questions. Anya, what do you think about that? Because you, you've been talking about similar things. You feel provoked about this idea of, of questioning openness to this, to this degree as it happens. Um, I, in many ways, agree with uh, Nathan. I think uh, the world is unequal, so the open internet will, to some extent, be unequal. I think there is more we can do in terms of openness to do better. I think we need more openness, not less. But to really be able to get there, I do think it's important, and so this is where I really agree with Nathan, that we see that what we consider a crisis is as much an opportunity. Um, it's not as if racism or casteism or um, biases against particular religions came because of the internet, right? It's just that for a few decades, somehow the status quo was such that some of these uh, feelings were swept more under the carpet. I think it was much less visible. And what the internet has done and, and the way the internet functions is bring some of that back up to the surface. And for me, that's a really important starting point for change actually, because it's much harder to address these things as long as they are subsumed, right? It's when it really comes to the surface that you can start to have much broader acknowledgement of these challenges and also collectively think about how to address them. Jerry, do you think this is sounding a little too utopian again? <laughs> how does uh, the community that, that you um, organize with online, how do they experience inequality and what are some of the things that you've been wishing for <laughs> in the things you've experienced? Um, I think the when we look at equality, especially when it comes to the web, we also have to look at um, access, and, and access is sort of the, like the basic start to participation on, on the web. And when we look at it from that level, then there is, it, it's very unequal, especially um, in the region that, that, that I come from, I come from Kenya. 
And when we look at, when we look at, in, at the web in terms of equality in access, then um, I, I, this, this, um, this comes to mind. And, and I think I just spoke to uh, you about this over, over lunchtime, what we call the Matthew effect, which is basically accumulated advantage. And this is basically drawn from the Gospel of Matthew where it says that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So what we are seeing, especially in regards to access to the web, is that there is a widening gap between those who have access to it and those who, uh, who do not have access to, to the internet. And at the, at the core of it is basically the level of education. So that sort of determines a lot. And uh, just to quote um, something that was said uh, by Anne Jalima of the World Web Foundation is that the richer and the better educated you people are, the more benefit they are gaining from the digital revolution. That sort of tells you where the starting point is. So if we are having a web where those who are rich and those who are better educated are the uh, ones that are mostly found in it, then we have a population that is not, is not participating in the conversation. So then how do we make it equal such that even those who do not have access to the internet in the first place have access to the internet? And I'm just from a session that we, uh, we were having with Ellery just a few minutes ago on, there have been efforts to sort of provide that level uh, playing field in terms of providing access to those without. And it's not the semblance of an internet. So again, we, we, we talk about, is some internet better than, than none? Because now if we are trying to sort of bridge that gap between those who do not have internet access and those with, is it with some semblance of internet access as conceptualized by a private company? How have you, Anya, how have you seen limiting internet access as a form of kind of strategic oppression in India? Yeah, I think the, the debate around access has evolved a, a lot as well, right? So it's still in part just about getting access to the technology. But what we saw in research we did was that there's also a lot of social norms that actually shape access. And we specifically looked at mobile phone bans in northern India for young unmarried women that were um, imposed or called for by caste associations. So traditional social cultural groupings that have no legal standing, but they have a lot of social power in those communities. And what we saw was that the absolute bans actually weren't particularly successful, but there was a really widespread consensus in these communities that girls basically should not be allowed to use mobile phones on their own, and that all their use at all times should be supervised. So for none of these girls, even if they had access to a phone, uh, the mobile aspect of that completely disappeared. It was like on Sunday, while your family could look over your shoulder in the family room, uh, you could use a phone. And the reasons for that were, um, the most cited reason we were given was that mobile phones allow for spaces of privacy, which these girls earlier didn't have access to, and that really threatened uh, the way these families see the world because of the possible access to the wrong boys uh, that would give. You know, so that's one example of how access actually gets shaped by a much wider set of, of concerns. And those are, those are sort of forms of inequality that happen through limiting access. What are some types of inequality that you've seen by having access? Um, what are some of the, the injustices that occur um, against women or against minorities that, that you think are problematic in this context? Um, I'll first speak on um, the, the, that inequality in terms of, uh, of, of, of access. And uh, uh, so what we are seeing is that a lot of, uh, we're seeing a lot of 